Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Where Does It Come From podcast. This time, I'm really excited to have with me a fellow ethical fashion brand founder, Susanna Wen, the co-founder of Birdsong. Now, Birdsong and I have, Birdsong and Where Does It Come From have kind of been side by side for many, many years in this space. And we obviously know each other well and have even drank wine together. <gasps> Shocking. Um, so, um, First of all, Susanna, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what drove you to set up Birdsong? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Susanna Wen. Um, so I, I'll start from the beginning, I guess. Um, I studied fashion design uh, at university and about 10 years ago now. And we were taught um, mostly like in-depth concepts of how to design a really fascinating collection or like have your story and your and your inspiration really intricate and inspiring and um and not much care or like thought was got was taken for who was actually going to make these clothes who where is it going to what are they going to be made out of um that was kind of secondary to to the the course um so and I, I was kind of brought up with um slightly Buddhist background. My mum um she has lots of meditation and I grew up going to uh, um retreats as a child. So kind of grew up with this um this kind of um I always basically thinking of how, what where where your food comes from, where you're just being compassionate in kind of every action. So fashion was obviously a big contrast to this. And I love being creative, I love making things. Um, but um, yeah, it was just, it was just, it was a bit conflicting to my my ethos and what I believed in. So I started getting really interested in ethical and sustainable fashion. And at, at that time there was um pioneers like People Tree used to work in a in a shop called Junkie Styling and they used to rip up old suits and make these really like couture pieces um, out of them. Um, yeah, you can be really creative basically with with these limitations of being um, ethical and sustainable. Um, so I got really interested in this, got really interested in secondhand clothing and the idea that um, often like upcycling can sometimes be like downcycling. You want to retain the value of, of the product and not um kind of take that value away um so I started uh, you're know, really passionate about ethical and sustainable fashion made a bio biodegradable final collection everything was yeah um, natural dyes um didn't have any trims on it everything was organic or even the thread um and instead of doing print um instead of printing because at that time there wasn't really any like uh eco printing I ma made my own patterns by pleating um so there's lots of surface and texture um design there and then I fashion is a very um competitive market so I went to work for a fashion brand in the US they were not sustainable <laughs> um they were churning out thousands of units of products every day um but I just knew personally um I needed to earn a wage mm. and I thought I could take my learnings from that and take and take it and and take it to somewhere else with better kind of um, ethics. Um, so I came back to London and I interned and freelanced at People Tree for a short time for about half a year, which was great because they are iconic um, in this industry. And um, Birdsong at that time were a marketplace. They were selling, um, Birdsong was founded by the original founders on a grad scheme. And um, they came up with this idea. They were working frontline with these women's groups um, at um, like elderly people centers uh, and lots of other frontline women's services. And they were seeing that these women were making products and they were trying to sell them at like markets. They weren't able to bring in a lot of, of revenue. So our original founder said, why don't we market and sell these products for you and help bring in more wages, more revenue to your organizations that are getting massively like their funding was being cut very dramatically at the time and still are um so they were selling the products that these groups were making already they'd get scarves that were like <laughs> this big something like this big everyone everything was like a one-off yeah um so they wanted to basically bring all of these skills in-house and design with one kind of aesthetic in mind 
make birds sound more like a traditional fashion brand. Mm. Um, so I joined about seven years ago, I think. So I co-founded our our collections mm. and our own brand line. Mm. And yeah, here we are. Yes, and, and it's interesting. There's a few things you said there that really interested me and similarities between the two of us, which is obviously not surprising. I'm not a designer, but I worked for a large corporate company. And it's interesting how you can pick up things you learn, but you pick up things you think, okay, this is something I want to not repeat. That's something I want not to do, isn't it? Um, and it's, it's, it's how you learn what your own ethos is and embedding what your learning is with your values and obviously with your Buddhist background. And the other thing I really picked up on was your people tree um, experience because the same for you. And we started to, um, nearly 10 years ago now. And there really was only people tree. There, there were other ones. Of course, there were other ones, other small brands. But in the mainstream, the person who were really pushing the boundaries and saying, um, this isn't right. We have to do things differently, you know, and, and really shouting about it was people tree. And for anyone watching on YouTube, I'm wearing a people tree jumper. I did buy seven or eight years ago and I still love it. <laughs> um, and, you know, Safia Mini, who who founded people tree, has gone on to do other great things. And I worked with Safia at an event last year and it was um, it was almost like a bit weird. Like, oh, my my hero. <laughs> I'm working with my hero. But it's um, it, it is wonderful to have these icons and these businesses and hopefully in the future where does it come from on birdsong well I already know there were students saying to me you know things like wow what you've done is great and I, I know it's the same with birdsong so you know we've had our senior people to follow and now it's it's kind of hopefully we're passing that journey along so um, with that in mind what do you think has really changed in the fashion industry in the last sort of 10 years because in ethical fashion especially but fashion more generally yeah yeah like as you said maybe 10 years ago there were a handful of ethical sustainable brands um when I was trying to look for a job in the industry it was like almost impossible um so yeah we ended up having to kind of make our own um and it's yeah it's interesting also what you said about like the legacy of of those brands having impact on us like hopefully our impact as ethical brands isn't just um, our Im immediate makers paying them fairly doing things in the correct way in the yeah. commas. Um, but it's also in hopefully influencing other fashion designers other students the the next generation to to consider um, different ways of of making clothes um, I think yeah so it's interesting when we first started Birdsong was um, something that the press really jumped on was our old tagline was no sweatshops, no Photoshop. And that was kind of revolutionary in the way that even body positivity, body positivity wasn't um, a common thing then. It was outrageous that we had models with underarm hair or that weren't size six. And um, yeah, that was quite controversial at the time. Whereas now, thank goodness, it's much more common to see everyday women represented in in fashion media so that's great did you expect um, that did you expect that that reaction when you just use normal people I don't um not maybe to the extent that that the feedback was that we received because some of it was like people were very shocked very offended you know and that just shows how ingrained your beauty ideals have become um trained by you know uh beauty ideals especially like in the 90s mm. growing up in the 90s early noughties just yeah. very like that aesthetic is like stick thin yeah, or stick thin just one and... kind of person yeah no it's interesting so... it reminds me it reminds me of um another great icon um Karen Franklin who used to head up the clothes show but now she does a lot of work on um I don't know all sorts of things empowerment and diversity and all of those things and I've been to a, two or three talks by her I remember her saying that when she was sitting around the board of a major brand um uh, a sort of a high what would you call it a well it was Debenhams I can say it <laughs> sitting around with the board, board of them and when the guys were talking about advertising they were talking about models that were young that were attractive and she was trying to say to them but these are like your daughters is this are these the people your daughters are looking to buy these clothes. Are these the women you want them to identify with? You know, it's it's just it's, it's slightly weird, isn't it? But it is. It's not their fault. It's how it was back then. It's how it was. It was you had the youngest, thinnest, um, most artificial looking people modelling clothes, and nobody could possibly look at them and think that's how I'm going to look if I wear that. 
Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, because we we our clothes, uh, we sell clothes from size UK size six to UK size thirty, and we try and show our clothes on models of as many different kinds of bodies as we can. Um, and yeah, it's just really really important to us. We want the imagery to be because we're a fashion brand. We're, we're you know we're in the business of fashion and and not I wouldn't say glamour, but you know we, we're we're trying to sell our beautiful products so we want it to be aspirational but we really want it to be you know attainable we want our customers to be able to mm. see themselves in this imagery and not kind of exacerbate any you know b- bad body image or no, exactly. we want people to feel good about themselves basically and I, I think also that what the change that has come about is it used to be the ideal of what men wanted or what men thought they wanted women to look like as opposed to what the women who would wear the clothes thought they would look like you know it's, it's, it's an empowerment thing that's happened over the last um 10 15 20 years i don't know but it's 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 a great thing and it's great that you're um you're pushing it i mean where does it come from for financial reasons we've always used um like my friends <laughs> um, i picked a woman out of the playground when i was dropping my kid off saying will you model for me you can have a free shirt kind of thing so we, we pick people like that and then more recently we um collaborated with a few other brands that were not fashion brands so did photo shoots together using again not models real people that they were they were mates with and i love that because it means a fashion shoot is fun you know it's a much more it's not it's not so professional but I know that when you're working with PR brands which we have they tend to say this is what the look you're going for this is what you're going for this is what your market wants and no it isn't it isn't what I want at all anyway we dive I diverted you onto that one because I thought it was interesting for people to hear about but going back what was it what do you think's really changed since Birdsong started in the general fashion market so I think as probably everyone can kind of see and has witnessed over the last few years, sustainability has become higher on the agenda for brands. Um, often it's kind of sold in in the fact that they're sustainable because of the fabrics they're using. Maybe there's a, there's a, a tiny percentage of a garment that is made out of recycled fibre, for example, but the rest of the garment is not. And they're mixed, so actually when fibers are mixed you can't recycle that product anymore so it's kind of that's it for that product um there's loads of ways brands can greenwash um and also sustainability for me and for birdsong is like it's not just what the what fibers you're using what fabric you're using but it's it's the ethics as well you can't have one without the other Mm. And you can't have an organic T-shirt, but it's made for slave wages, um, and which it, which is you know sometimes the case. Um, Definitely. Yeah. So so I think people are speaking about it more, but yeah, it's it, it's not quite enough. No, well, it's it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I was I was researching one of the major um, fast fashion brands and um, for a radio interview, and I was looking at their website and all the things they were claiming to do we do 27% of this, we do 24% of that. So what about the other, you know, do my maths here, 83, no, 73% of whatever you're doing is why isn't that done with these accreditations? Why aren't you using organic? Why aren't you using all of these Mm. different things? So they make these boasts, but if you actually look at the numbers, it's really small, but at Mm. least they're saying it now, at least they're putting it out there in a lot of cases, which is great. Yeah, totally. I think there's a lot more regulation about greenwashing now, so you can't claim that it's it's ethical and sustainable when when it's not. So that's yeah. like that's a really good thing that's coming out of um come out of the last few years. Definitely, definitely. And, and I mean, it's it's interesting times, isn't it? I mean, I, I've noticed how much more sustainability and ethical fashion, in particular, pops up in the news. Whereas when we first started, it was never mentioned at all in mainstream news. Yeah, yeah, it was really, really niche. And I think it's interesting because bigger brands who who do have the most impact, you know, globally in terms of ethics and sustainability, they're always, they you know, they'll be looking at their bottom line and they want to be remain competitive. So they're kind of, I I, I believe that they'll, that they're obviously really concerned about the environment, but they've realised their customers are now looking for and they want to buy things with with less environmental impact mm-hmm. and that are made for, for better wages. But it's always a... 
the whole industry almost kind of has to change before one does if that makes yeah. sense yeah um exactly. because yeah it, customers aren't quite they don't see how much it takes to make a garment and they they can't visualize that cost which is not by any means their fault but um yeah it's that connection to to that product and how it's been made I think is has been lost a little bit yeah I think so I think definitely that I mean one thing I was talking at a, a conference last week um about it, was, it reminds me to, back to a previous podcast we did with the actor Paul Baisley that I know you and I chatted about but he um he talked about the fact that we've moved away from valuing people who touch the land who are part of the land and touch the products and make the products we've almost our, our sort of capitalist marketing culture is all about you don't want to think about that you want to get your hands dirty metaphorically with that you just want to see the glossy lovely new product and not think about that but actually older values like I'm sure your Buddhist values are about be actually being part of that all the way through this production you know and valuing the people who have done that it's, it's a skill it's a wonderful thing not something you hide behind a glossy label you know yeah and I think customers in the UK they love to shop from independence you know makers based in the UK might be a, a woman who owns ceramicist um, studio around the corner or you know independent makers um and I think it's, they're, they're really proud to wear something or, or have something in their home that's made by just a creative um, in their local neighbourhood. Yeah, someone they um, know. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so it's funny that it, it, it's when something's made across, you know, on the other side of the world that um, there's that distance and you don't, you, you don't have that story. You don't, you can't say where it's from. No, exactly. Um, that's why we both we both do, obviously, <laughs> say where things are from. And I think that's it does help people. I, I think people do want that, but they don't put any monetary value on that at the moment. I'm being very generalistic because many people obviously do. But like you say, it's more because they don't know to because they don't understand, as you say, the processes and the impacts, I suppose, of if you farm cotton in this way as opposed to that way. As you yeah. mentioned, if you mix cotton with polyester, and that may, means the whole thing can't be recycled. Yeah. Exactly, there's a whole lot of issues. And I think there's also the mass production issue as well. So a lot of major brands talk, talk the talk with the greenwashing, et cetera, and, and the good work that they're doing. But they're still making huge amounts of garments, which is leading to negative impacts on the planet, yeah. but also on the workers. Yeah, it's been so interesting because I feel like consumers in the hit in the UK or in the West, we we only, we only see the the marketing angle. We only see what the company wants you to see, and and we don't understand the the industry as the whole, the enormous fashion industry that's churning away the the distribution, the sourcing, the. Oh, there's a there's a statistic. It's like a, a standard dress from the high street will have traveled through seven countries before it gets to you so it could be made somewhere and it could, the labels could be put in somewhere else buttons could be added in another country um then the warehouse is another country and then it comes here mm. um and it, i have a similar thing with like the food industry um i love food yeah. <laughs> i listen to a lot of food podcasts but i'm really interested in like the whole like yeah the whole process of before like a potato gets to me and it's it's something really fascinating it's just like a it's a whole world that is that is you know functioning and thousands of people are involved in getting this product to you um find it really interesting no it is really interesting it is really interesting and um it's a shame you couldn't make it to the um, festival of natural fibers last week because of course we discussed things like soil and agriculture and there were some really knowledgeable people there a lot more knowledgeable than me about that and talking about root length of crops and <laughs> things like that and you think wow that is just so amazing and i without going off on the sideline again um soil is an amazing thing isn't it so uh, the health of soil what a difference it can make to food the taste of food the growth of food but other crops too and and it's just it's an amazing resource that i don't think well, i personally don't have any understanding of but most of what we have if not all starts off in soil i mean putting aside oil-based products like um polyester and that kind of thing but foods and um clothing products mainly start from soil and it is like you say that they step through a huge number of different steps 
and it's what uh, what's done in those steps what fertilizers are used you know and all of those kind of things what dyes are used for clothing and food that actually turns it into the product that arrives with us and we yet we have no idea it's just bizarre anyway yeah. i'll stop talking about soil and go back to talking about ethical fashion so as a designer You've talked a little bit, but I, I want you to share a little bit more with people about how you know that your product, clothing and accessories meet your strong ethical stance. Yeah, sure. So everything we make bar our jewellery and our base T-shirts are made in the UK. So we source um, fabric from um, the best ethically sound um, suppliers that we can. Cardi, um, <laughs> <laughs> Cardi included. Um, we want there to be some social impact in that chain. In that chain, we want there to be living wages provided. We want minimal kind of um, chemicals going into the ecosystem in the production of that fabric. Um, and once we get the fabric or yarn or materials, we um, hand these over to our maker groups. So we have all of our maker groups are in roughly a five like mile radius of each other in East London. Um, we have shoemakers, we have seamstresses, embroiderers, um, printmakers, um, and we work mostly with enterprise arms of charity. So these are all women facing barriers to employment. Um, and our warehouse works with people with learning disabilities to pack and send out our products. Um, we know all of our makers. We know them by name. We have shared food with them, shared celebrations with them. Um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a different relationship maybe to just having a factory and and sending um, orders to them and and berating them when they've done something wrong. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, we physically know them. We physically pay them ourselves. Yeah. So that's we're we're not um, you know giving it to, like outsourcing mm, yeah our it's work we do as much as we can in-house so that's how we can ensure it mm, absolutely and I, and I think that goes along with the um the model of I wouldn't say don't say small production because it's not small production but it's it's intimate production I suppose so you're creating things you're not just creating loads and loads and loads of things that will sit in a warehouse and at some point someone might order off of Amazon and out the door it goes. It's kind of thing. It's it's much more of a relationship between you, your customers, your makers, you know, and even your fabric producers, which I think and it's the model we we have as well. I think it's um very much the way that things need to go. People are, you know, investing in these pieces and there's this great story behind everything, which is benefiting everybody involved in the chain whereas I think the model that exists at the moment is more like one one part of the train chain always trying to get something over on another part of the tra chain so the customer's always trying to get the cheapest markdown they can get the um, brand is trying to get the cheapest deal from the supplier the supplier's trying to get the cheapest deal from whatever and the person at the end of the chain normally the farmer ends up you know we won't go into farmer suicides but ends up desperate because they haven't got enough money to feed their family because someone's always trying to get one over on you all the way along rather than saying we're inclusive um and we're all helping each other to bring this beautiful thing to this customer who has joined us as a stakeholder in this process so you know it sounds amazing Susanna and I've followed your work obviously for years and um I think what you're doing is fantastic I love the fact that the makers are so closely located so that it's almost like you can just pop in and see what's going on but I think that also helps with creativity because we don't work a huge amount with makers in the UK more in India but having been there and spoken to them and, and having regular meetings with them on zoom or whatever it's taking their input as well that makes a huge difference if they say to you this isn't going to work this fabric doesn't doesn't tailor in the way that we thought maybe we should make this change rather than just chucking a design and saying make this you know you can actually make better products can't you definitely definitely because we make make we make a lot of our products made to order so you, got, you can order something on our website and it'll arrive within it varies but within two to four weeks so um the customer has a say in in their product they can amend lengths etc and 
that and then the, and the maker will physically make that product for them and it's it's just a little cottage industry almost like you have your own personal tailor you know yeah. um you have an active um input into into your garment and if, if they want to add a note or make a change i will just let the makers know and um yeah it's all very connected i love that personal tailor idea i think that's a really good idea and you know i mean as you know i'm i love the idea of people ordering something and it being made for them purely for the environmental reasons as well because it means you're not going to have every garment in every size and every color and every length sitting there in a warehouse wasting it's you're, you're making it as it is required which is got to be better for the planet you, you, there's no sense of needing to burn stock or sell off stock cheap or anything like that because you're making what is required and ordered so it's um it's definitely a big advantage. Yeah, I think the overproduction of products is like a, a major reason of why the impact of the fashion industry is so bad on the environment. It isn't just these fibres, it isn't just the way they're created, it's actually the afterlife of all these products that brands aren't, aren't, aren't being able to sell and what they do with that. So it's either landfill or it's burning. And um and yeah, that that has I think it's like an enormous proportion it is, of, it is. of the overall impact. And dumping on other economies that ruins their industries as well. So it's, mm. it's just um mm. it's just terrible. I mean, you think about what happened back in COVID when all the clothing that was being produced in factories in the Far East, and then the major brands said, Well, we can't we can't open our shops now, we can't sell this, so we're not gonna pay you for it. You, I know you've made it and you've paid your workers. We're not going to pay you for it. It's just going to sit there in warehouses. And it did. And people lost their jobs. And these brands, you know, some of them did contribute in the end when they were pushed. But many of them just said, no, it's not our problem. Our our payment terms are such that we pay on delivery and we didn't want delivery. So therefore, tough. Anyway, yeah. so your model's much better is what I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think this is why supporting small independent brands is so important because naturally as a small brand you only have you have a physical limit of what you can produce and most likely it you know it will be made by you know in a smaller ecosystem um so even even if they're not making things for the sustainable fabrics or or necessarily paying ethically were you very suzanne oh you're back good <laughs> can you hear me Oh, sorry. It's all right. You froze. Yes, I, can. I can edit that. I can know. hear you. Let's try that again. So say what you were saying again. I'll edit it. Yes. Oh, sure. I don't breathing. know why that's happening. Yeah. Sorry about that. Just keep talking. Um, yeah. Naturally, as a small independent brand, you're going to be so much more sustainable because your production is manageable. You're not going to be placing loads of orders that you can't fulfill. You'll be so yeah just supporting small makers even if they're not making out of sustainable fabrics or even paying like fair wages necessarily which most are um your impact is just going to be so much less than than a massive company where who can't tell you where they think products are made you have no idea what's sitting in the stock room um it's often like you're being sold these products um they they kind of call the shots of like trends and things you should buy sometimes it's just because they've got loads of stock of it yeah you know exactly. they need to Colour, shift it yeah. so so you've you've got to, yeah be a bit wary of my i think that is it's trying to it is that trying to educate customers in different things and i think another thing with smaller brands as you say is normally a smaller brand wants you to love the thing that you're buying you know so it's not the same as they're just trying to get rid of it we want the customers to love it because we've made it and it's something we have a personal investment in so when somebody comes back and says I don't want that thing that I bought can I send it back that's almost well first it's the happy dance thing when someone orders something but there's also when they want to send it back if there's something wrong with it then you kind of think oh, okay then we'll take that on the chin kind of thing but when someone just says do you know I don't really like it you know and it, it actually is upsetting personally, isn't it? Because I had one last week where a lady emailed and said she wanted to send a shirt back because she didn't it didn't like it. But then she said, but my husband absolutely loves it. So can I swap it from a size medium to a size extra large so that he can have it? I'm like, yes, yes, because if he loves it, I want him to have it, you know. So, so yeah, it's those kind of things. There is a personal thing there. It's not like the other brands that they assume they're going to get loads of returns and that just ends up, you know, back, back being burned or put into landfill or something. So, 
I completely agree with you. Buy from small businesses, ethical if you can, but even not. Small businesses are the way to go because it supports such a different kind of beneficial ecosystem. So talking of which, I know that we've talked about all the benefits and all the good things that Birdsong have been doing and the ethical fashion environment is doing. But tell us about some of the not so good things. Tell us about some of the lows that have happened over the last few years, because I know that with COVID and everything. Whew. Yeah, sure. I think running a any any small business or, or any business will stop. Um, your, your highs are higher and your lows are lower than than maybe employees would be. <laughs> and I think often the success of the business is only as successful as you kind of feel, feel yourself as a, as a founder. Um, yeah, I think during lockdown, lockdown was actually a good time for us. Um, I feel like we had to close our makers down. Obviously, everyone was self-isolating. We wanted to keep them safe. Some, some other factories were open, but we everyone was closed who worked for us. And we had to close our, we didn't close our orders, but we couldn't produce anything. But orders kept coming in and we were, and we said bank it for like a brighter day and people would. And it was, it was amazing because everyone felt really, they wanted to support the community. They wanted to support our makers. You know, it's a difficult time. I think people had, you know, you know, a very privileged position. Um, so, some people had some spare money, you know, they weren't going out. So that was actually a good time. And then coming out of it, the world has just it changes every day. I feel like the last few years have been completely wild. Um, people coming back into the retail landscape, people out and about again. But um, but yeah, and then online shopping still doing really well. Um, greenwashing becoming much bigger, mm. and it it's just it makes it more difficult to stand out um, yeah. because as a small brand because what we're saying which is very, our actions are so different from, from the high streets. Um, what we're trying, yeah, all the positive impact we're having, I think is, is enormously different, but to communicate that is, is difficult because if the high street is saying they're, everything they're making is hundred percent sustainable, fair wages, etc. cetera. Um, and, and we are too, it, it, the customer can't really tell the difference i think no. so it's it's hard it's difficult to stand out as a small brand it's difficult to gain new customers but um i am seeing like a lot of a lot more small small sustainable brands like solo makers mm. brands just starting in their bedrooms you know coming out which i think is only better for 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 independent business um a bit of value of of where the product is coming from um is growing so that's good, it is good um yeah. it's just it's just yeah difficult it's always yeah, it is and <laughs> i think the amount of time and effort when you are competing against major brands and greenwashing time and effort in things like um social media and pr and all of those kind of things to be seen and it takes up so much budget and time that you'd really rather be spending supporting makers and creating beautiful products but there's no point if if it's not being seen so it's getting that we've always have as small business owners you have to become experts in messaging and pr and things as well don't you which is a you know it's the the game i suppose a small business owner has to do everything but yeah it, it's it, it's interesting times isn't it but i suppose i don't know about you but for me the bigger picture of doing something like this and getting involved in this space is we do want to push the bigger brands to do things better because it's they're going to have a bigger impact if they start changing the way that they do things so turning it around I always feel depressing as it can sometimes be um, you can sort of think well at least if us existing has made customers go to their brands and say hang on we want more transparency we want to know who made it we want to know where it's made we want to know what you're going to do with unsold stock then you know it makes changes happen so for example with um the slavery in china it, with um the uyghurs they um they have all, a lot of fashion brands have pulled out of that completely because of customer pressure so it's got to be a good thing hasn't it mm. yeah, absolutely. yeah there can be some positives um if you look at it <laughs> deep deeply enough <laughs> but it's it's hard yeah definitely. totally as a business owner, i think it's really important to step out of your day-to-day -day, yeah which i don't do enough um but it's important to have the yeah, just a, a a better overall view of 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 the business and and the and the world instead of um 
firefighting. Yes, and firefighting is a good term for it. But I think um, as well, the danger is um, that we don't know the good that we're doing, you know, and I'm equally guilty of this one. So I'm going to say to you here and now, Susanna Birdsong, you're doing really good things in the world. You know, you're supporting all these makers. You're raising the awareness of disparity of, of models. You're um, you're raising the awareness of the stories behind clothes. You know, you're doing fantastic work. So never feel that you're lost in some situation where people don't know what you're doing. It is noticed and people know what you are doing and you're creating a legacy. So I think we we sometimes forget that, don't we? Thank you so much. That's very kind. Jo. Make you blush. <laughs> anyway, um, we talked a bit about pricing and the, the, the challenges of um, doing things sustainably. We're entering into a period now in the UK and I know elsewhere too, where we're going into a cost of living crisis where people are literally going to have not enough money to pay the bills to pay for their food and whatever and at the same time we've got the climate emergency hot on on our agendas all the time that wasn't meant to be a pun but um we've got that to face as well how do we feel that ethical fashion and birdsong in particular can support our customers in these times to balance this cost of living this climate emergency it's a tricky one yeah totally and it's always um it's always a bit of a paradox. We are a a clothing company that's fighting for, um, you know, sustainability, not not climate breakdown. We're trying to do good in the in the world, but we're also trying to save uh, to sell clothes. So, like, yeah, it can be. It's it's like it doesn't really match up sometimes. But we think that you know our products are creating living wages in the UK. That's always important. Um, we it's our responsibility to make products that you want that will make your life better you we're not trying to push products on you necessarily we as the most sustainable thing in your wardrobe is obviously what you already have but if you need a new jumper you can come to us and get an absolutely delightful joyful organic cotton living wage piece that will make you feel beautiful um you know we're here for that we're here to provide that service um so yeah that's that, that's our responsibility to our customers um we need we need joy in our lives you know um we're trying you know which we'll we're going to relook at our prices and try and maybe take a little bit less margin or offer a a discount choice for our customers so if you are earning less then you have an option to pay less at Birdsong. Um, we don't want it to be, you know, we want to have fairly accessible pricing. Um, yeah. But I think um, I think what some people spend thousands on a garment, some people do. You know, if you're going to go to some of the top designers, there are people, bizarre as it seems, I've never been one of them, who will go and buy the latest Gucci or you know some of these really really top brands so we know there are people who are spending obscene amounts of money on clothing I don't think that paying fair wages and for good materials is necessarily needs to, to drop your prices you know it's just making it accessible in other ways I mean I think I think I think people need to go back a little bit more to the save up model rather than the I need to buy it straight away. It's like I need to buy that in November. Therefore, I'll put so much away per week if I can. And I'm not saying that people can afford this at all. You know, I'm just saying that is, this is the difficulty of the model, isn't it? But we know that there is what we're doing. Both of us is not anywhere near that high end. It's just nowhere near the five pound T-shirt sort of thing. Yeah, and I have no I have no interest in being a designer brand. You know, I want to be a brand that I can afford. Mm -hmm. I want to be a brand that like my friends and family can afford. Um and yes, it's extremely we're going into an extremely tricky period, but people are still gonna have like disposable income. So I think it's um just thinking about where you're putting your money, I guess. Yeah. If you're thinking... going to spend fifty pounds, a hundred pounds a month on something to treat yourself, maybe maybe try and try and spend it with a company that um really excites you. Yeah. Um, that you yeah. know you know the founders, you know 
where it's made. You know, and you know where the money's going. You know exactly where the money's yeah. going. It's not going into overstocking and causing, you know, all sorts of waste and, and those kind of issues. It's it's a really difficult one. And I really feel for people, I really do, um, that want to buy things. And they, they almost need a hit every month, like you say, um, and to go out to somewhere and buy something. If they could just hold off and invest in something that would really help others as well as themselves they they will feel better about themselves as well but you know we've all got to do what we've got to do and it's a it, it's a really hard time for everybody I think and there's, there's no answer there's no clear answer is there here it's a, it's a really difficult one um, anyway the last thing I was going to ask you is what's next for Susanna and Birdsong well we're very happy to have kept going for I think eight years <laughs> Uh, which is fantastic and we just hope to be able to continue making fantastic products continue making providing living wages in our local area and globally and um and to continue our work to be honest we have yeah we sell things on our website so do check us out there uh birds on London. London. <laughs> we inquire <laughs> And um, we're, off, we're also opening a B2B merchandise offering. So we can print your branded goods and it can be B Corp certified as we are living wage certified. Um, and yeah, we hope to, even before the end of the year, we've got loads of exciting collaborations, artist collaborations, loads of exciting things in the run up to Christmas. So yeah, do stay tuned. Brilliant. No, well, that's, Fantastic, Susanna. I'm so glad that Birdsong came through everything, um, the COVID and everything that's been happening the last uh, few years. It's been a manic time for us all. Um, and thank you so much for um, spending time with us on the Where Does It Come From podcast today. Thanks so much, Joe. Let's work out to stop recording.